because one of the books that you've written, um, the Encyclopedia of Women's Baseball, to me is, is pretty fascinating because not only does it go into, because I think many people would look at that and think that it's just the history of uh, the All-American All American League. Yeah, and that they're <laughs> in there, right? Sure they are, yeah. But a couple of, I want to say it was maybe two months ago, just in doing some digging, every day I kind of I try to do a little bit of amateur sleuthing myself, digging around on newspapers.com or wherever, trying to find something interesting to put out there. And I've come mm-hmm. across some crazy things and some interesting things and some fun things. But one of the things I came across, uh, and this was after I, I had spoken with uh, uh, Todd Peterson and Pete Gorton, and they were doing they did all that work on baseball on up in Minnesota, and then on John Donaldson and so forth. So I was digging around looking for things about. Um, the John Donaldson and the Kansas City Monarchs. And I came across first um, the fact that, you know, J.O. Wilkerson was so far ahead of his time (laughs) as an owner when it came to what he was doing. But he had, his first team had women on it, which fascinated me. What what, what was her name? It was... um, Well, you're uh, talking about Carrie Nash. Carrie the, Nation, there you go. Carrie Nation, yeah. Yeah, and so so then when I found Carrie Nation, I had to do a little bit more digging, and then I came across so many things that, man, if you if you could just touch on some of these, because, you know, I came across people like uh, Jackie Mitchell and, and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, Lizzie Murphy and, and, you know, Elizabeth Stroud, and I'm trying to think of who else, and, and the Bloomer Girls, and, and, and knowing that Rogers Hornsby played, uh, and, and Tris Speaker were playing with the Bloomer Girls, which I don't think people yeah. would ever even equate oh, no. that. Yeah, they certainly would not. <laughs> and, but, and then, well, you know, to tie the two of those together, you, you, you also did another book that was about um, Negro League baseball history. And mm-hmm. so I also came across the Dolly Vardens of Philadelphia, which goes back to the 1860s in women's baseball. 1880s, actually. 1880s, okay. Well, that's one of those myths. That okay. there's, a, there's a picture floating around out there that has caused, and for a while we did think that the Dolly Vardens team of the 1860s was a women's team. Turns out it was a men's team. Really, and the women's team comes along in 1883, and the picture that everybody keeps pub- posting and publishing about the Dolly Vardens is actually a YWCA team from the 1920s. Wow. There is no picture of the Dolly Vardens that anybody has it discovered. Seemed, it to seemed date. it seemed incredulous to me too that someone would have snapped that picture from 1880. Right, yeah. thank you. That's <laughs> you didn't have to think too hard to realize that that picture had to be later than. Yeah. Uh, but but the Dolly Vardens are a women's there were two Dolly Varden baseball women's baseball teams black waist playing in Philadelphia in 1883 along with a third team that played in the same city called also women's team called the Captain Jinx and so we have three black women's baseball teams playing in the city of Philadelphia in 1883 wow. now how good were they etc that's a tough thing to to get our hands around but it doesn't matter they were playing they were there and, you know, you're talking about the Negro League stories not being told. Well, women's baseball is even less well known. I'm sure. Um, because most everybody, their only point of reference is the movie A League of Their Own. And they know about the All American ah, League and think that that's, that's right. the whole story. That's right. And it's like, that is about this much of the story. It's an important part of the story for sure, but it is not the whole story. I'm going to put up while we're talking here that um, web page I told you about. At least it lists. At least it lists your books. Uh, the uh, baseball uh, guru site, just so people can see them and what we're talking about here. So, so there's the um, mm-hmm. there's the Encyclopedia of Women and Baseball. Um, so you that came out in summer of 2006. So what else can we find in that? I know I, I think I probably mentioned a few of the names that are in there. But... Well, you're going to find everything from the some of the names you mentioned. But um, we've so you've got talking about the Bloomer teams of the early 20th century, but they're preceded by a group of women's teams called the Reds and the Blues, and it literally was the belts on their uniforms were either red or blue, and so they wore. And so there's a, that's 19th century. You've got women's college baseball teams in the 19th century. Uh, the Vassar Resolutes is kind of where that starts, but there are so many others. 
And then not only do you have players, but you have Amanda Clement, for example, first female umpire. In 1905, thank you very much. Wow. She umpired for a number of seasons and paid her way through college from the money she made umpire, right? <laughs> um, sadly, she starts in 1905 and we still only had seven or eight uh, female umpires to the present day and none of them at the major league level, but they're all in there. Um, you, wow. um, one of my favorite players of the very early period is a young lady by the name of Alta Weiss who played in Ohio. Um, her dad was a uh, doctor. She ended up becoming a doctor. She wanted to play baseball, so her dad basically bought her a team so that she could play. Uh, and she was the pitcher oh. for the team. And they changed the name, and they became the Weiss All-Stars. And she was the centerpiece. You have a name like Maud Nelson. Maud Nelson, um, currently, there's a campaign underway. It's just starting to try to pull together all the incredible details of her career to try to push to get her into the Hall of Fame. She would be then, wow. if we could do it, the second woman ever, since Epa Manley certainly is in there. That's right. Um, and there's your Negro League connection. Yeah. So Epa Manley, owner, she's in there. Okay. But there's a whole cool. series of owners. And it starts with um, Helene Britton, who owned the St. Louis Cardinals in the 19-teens. And I guarantee you nobody knew that. No. And then <laughs> as far as the Negro Leagues go, everybody talks about Epa Manley. Yes, Epa Manley is in the Hall of Fame. She, but the very first female Negro League owner is Olivia Taylor in 1922 and 1923 right. and 1924. C.I. Taylor's yes. wife, right? After he yeah. passed away. That's right. Yep. Cool. Yeah. And so, so the, the, the encyclopedia includes all of these. It also includes some international as well because base, awesome. baseball has been played all, over the, all around the world. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, these are the types of stories that I, I really, I, I think people need to uh, well, I'm hoping hear more about. I'm finishing up a, a new edition of it because, as you said, it, it's been almost 15 years since mm -hmm. it came out. And so lots has happened. I've learned lots. In fact, the new edition will probably be a multi-volume one. At least that's what we're <laughs> expecting. Cool. Which will really shock people to discover there's that much history about women's baseball. I bet. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Let me ask you this.